civic institutions, arts advocates, and agents of change. I'm so excited to see a packed room here. Uh, thanks for joining us here in person and on the live stream. So, the origin story of this panel began last summer as I was writing an article about four arts organizations who had decided to become polling places uh, for the 2016 elections. So they were welcoming their community members into their spaces to do their civic duty. Uh, YBCA, uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and Cornerstone Theater were both uh, theaters that were uh, featured in that story. And they mentioned partners like Arts for LA, Alliance for Justice, and TCG as great resources. So I'm really thankful for TCG for bringing all those folks together here today for the panel. Although uh, Megan Wallace from Cornerstone will be coming late, so you'll see her enter through the door at any point uh, throughout our session and rush to the front of the stage. So much has changed in the year since that article was written in the civic landscape. But the thing that I've been most excited to see develop is arts leaders stepping up as civic leaders. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So what do we mean by civic leaders? I think that looks like a lot of different things. Uh, civic leaders are leveraging artistic resources, skills, or assets to make a difference in the civic life of their community. So the civic life of their community, they're making a substantive difference to making communities that are empowered and safe and healthy, environmentally responsible, uh, economically empowered as well. It means engaging the political process. That looks like becoming polling places, getting out the vote, encouraging others to vote, uh, hosting candidate forums. It's like directly engaging in, in the political process. And it looks like advocating for issues that might be direct funding of the arts, but it might also be immigration reform or housing issues or living wage that impacts our communities and the people who work at our institutions. So over the next 90 minutes, uh, we want the session to be informative, interactive, and inspiring. We're gonna ask you for your questions and your insights at several points. We want this to be a two-way dialogue. Uh, and we want you to walk away from this session having learned something, but in the best uh, examples of civic uh, organizing, we also want you to do something when you go home, either within your organization or within your community. So we have a lot to cover, <coughs> but let's introduce the panel first. So I'm Devin, I'm the co-founder of Measure. We're a consulting firm here in Portland, working with arts organizations and other nonprofits on communication strategy. I'm Sarah Matlin. I'm bilingual counsel at Alliance for Justice. We help nonprofits figure out their advocacy rights, including you. You'll hear a lot more about what we do and how we can help you when uh, it's my turn on the panel. I'm John Moscone. I'm the chief of civic engagement at Hero Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. I'm Jennifer Fuku Tommy Jones, director of programs at Arts for LA, and we're the regional arts advocacy organization for the Los Angeles County. Laurie Baskin, director of research policy and collective action at Theater Communications Group. And then Megan Wallace will be here uh, yes. from Cornerstone Theater. Absolutely. So let's get to know you. This is going to be a quick fire. I want you to shoot your hands up real high, real quick, gut reaction. Is your organization leveraging artistic resources, skills, or assets to make a difference in the civic life of your community? Awesome. Yeah. Get it down. Who isn't doing that yet but wants to be? Excellent. Who's engaging in the political process already? Not the same. All right, them down. And who isn't yet but wants to be? All right, a few more there. And who's advocating for issues in their community? Lots of folks. Awesome. Get them down. And who isn't doing that yet but would like to be? Perfect. All right. Thanks for helping us get to know you a little bit more. Now we want to um, start getting questions early and frame our conversation with some of your questions in mind. We'll, we'll pause for several times throughout the session to get more questions and make this more of a dialogue. But for right now, we want to spend about five minutes. And I'm going to grab, yeah, do you want to write, write them down? That'd be awesome. Thank you, John. So questions about today. What, what is it you want to get answered? What are you trying to learn from this session today? Shout them out quick. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about going as far as being a polling station, can you actually talk about the like legality of keeping your nonprofit status? We sure will. We have an awesome lawyer in the house with us that will share that cool. information with you. <laughs> yes. Skills for navigating boards who might be a little terrified. Awesome board engagement. Yes. No, telling off that um, when we're partnering with large institutions like we're part of the university setting, sort of how those structures influence what we can do legally. Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. We're Awesome. Who else? Yes. So, best practices for messaging about how you um, 
talk to your audience community about why you're doing all of this stuff in addition yeah. to, like, aren't you just supposed to be making plays? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Aren't you just an arts organization? Right. And why are you yeah. doing civic engagement? Yeah. Yes. How to not exclude folks of different perspectives. Awesome. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, living in a purple area. Yep. And how so issues yeah, yeah that, that being civically engaged is yeah. not being liberal elitist. Does civic yeah. engagement only happen in the urban core? Does it only happen for progressive issues? Yeah. Other? All right, we've got a oh, good, oh, okay. yep. I want someone to talk about agency through creativity. Um, some of the articles I read about, and, and divorcing creativity from money. All right, so tell, tell me a little bit more, what do you mean by that? Just, it, it seems like if we're engaging in, in civic um, action, like, you know, ways to do it yourself, sort of, and, and maybe in this, um, and the theme of radical partnerships that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I'm throwing out every single thing I read in that article. So I'm just Sorry, it's not very so okay. right. Radical partnerships. <laughs> I think we've got that. Let's no. <laughs> That's one more, and then we'll start, and then I'll come back to people. Yes. That's, no? Okay. We'll just start. <laughs> and I'll just make John pace back and forth. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So our first question was around legal. Let's go go to legal first. All right. As a, as a section? Yes. Okay. As a section. All right. So yeah, you all started there. Thank you. All righty. Um, show of hands again. How many of you are scared right now about what's Ooh. happening in your community? Oh. Or what could happen? <laughs> <laughs> Lobbying 
more or less, is influencing legislation. That is gonna help. Um, the, um, the waving people in to come, come on up and yeah. there are no seats, there's, there's no one here. Okay. Um, so, now we know, lobbying is not just making change in the community, it's not just talking to somebody about a law, it's actually working to change the law. All right, little reminder here, 501c3 public charities, that's us, Alliance for Justice, that is um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. That is Jiva. I grew up on Jiva. Who's here from Jiva? Thank you very much, Genesee Valley. That is what taught me about theater. Um, we've got um, Child's Play, uh, Americans for the Arts. We've also got um, the Root Mechanics. Now, all of these organizations, 501c3s. The cool thing about being 501c3, you get to keep your money, you get to help other people keep their money. You do not have to pay taxes on your income, you get to tell your donors you will pay less in taxes. And you also comply with private foundation grants. Not saying it's easy, but it's relatively easy compared to other types of organizations. There's a trade-off. When you want to change legislation, you are allowed to do that. You are allowed to push to make new laws and keep good ones and stop bad ones. But you can't do it till the cows come home. You can't do it 100% of your time because that's illegal. It is limited your right to lobby. We'll talk about what that means and your choices for that. Another trade-off. You can never be involved in partisan political activity. Partisan political activity. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically, you can't support or oppose oh. candidates for public office. You can support ballot measures, because those are people. So, <laughs> that is 501c3s in a nutshell. By the way, everything I'm saying here, if you have questions later, we are there for you. Next column though, 501c4s. I think of 501c4s as 501c3s on steroids, okay? They get to do everything that 501c3s can do and more, except a few things, we'll talk about that. Uh, we have our own affiliated 501c4. Um, Americans for the Arts Action Fund is a 501c4 and so now you'll notice there's some things in there that aren't 501c4s. We've got a 501c5, which is Actor, Actors' Equity. We have a 501c6. So 501c4, so 501c5s are unions. 501c6s, like Drumtis Guild of America, they are professional associations. Chamber of Commerce, American Medical Association, American Bar Association. So um, uh, uh, Drumtis uh, Guild. Is, a, is like the Bar Association and Chamber of Commerce. They also don't have to pay taxes on the income they receive. However, they cannot tell their donors, give us money, you'll pay less in your taxes. That's illegal, they don't have that right. And it's really hard for them to get private foundation grants. It's doable, but it's not easy. The difference is though, that means they don't have a trade-off. They can lobby, they can influence legislation as much as they want to without women. They can do that till the cows come home. They can do that 100% of their time. They can also do other stuff, but that's what they can do. Now, they also are allowed to say, to support or oppose a candidate. A lot of them choose not to, but they can, and if they do, they have to follow election law. Looking at the last column here, political organizations. Um, so we've got the Emily's List, the Democratic Party, and um, uh, Americans for the Arts Action Fund PAC which is, exists to support or oppose candidates, to get people to win or lose elections. That's what they are there for, that's why they exist. They also do not have to pay taxes on the able to speak they receive, but they cannot tell their donors, give money to us to help someone win a, 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 a election and you'll pay less in your taxes. It just doesn't exist, they can't do that. And also, they're really not supposed to help, um, uh, uh, so they're not supposed to influence Legislation, why is that? They get someone elected into the office and they say, I pass this law. That's a real conflict of interest. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's not supposed to happen, okay? And um, so they, their reason for existing is to get people elected. So we can have a whole other conversation about how you do or don't collaborate with those folks, but we show this to make it really clear. You are allowed to influence legislation. Not only are you allowed to, we want you to. We want you to. We want you to. And you can. 
We'll talk about what limited lobbying means. That's completely legal. It's also illegal to influence the outcome of candidate election. We'll talk more about that. Um, and I'm not going to take questions on this page until we finish with the section, but I do be writing down a question you, any questions that you have. All right, I keep saying that lobbying is limited, limited is lobbying, lobbying is limited, limited is lobbying. Okay, what does that actually mean? And of course, like a good lawyer, I'm going to say, it depends. So <laughs> what does that really look like? All right, when you're born as a 501c3 organization, you start out with one way, to get, the IRS hands you one way to measure how much you're allowed to influence legislation, how much you're allowed to lobby. And the automatic test for all 501c3s that they're born with is called the insubstantial part test. Now, the IRS is really good about, about being vague. <laughs> and so, no, they say, well, you're supposed to dedicate an insubstantial amount of your efforts to lobbying. What does insubstantial mean? <laughs> no clue. Well, we do have a clue, actually. We figured out over time that it means you can dedicate about three to five percent of your efforts to lobbying. Three to five percent. That's kind of small. You can actually easily go over it and not really notice it. And part of the problem is the definition for lobbying is so vague. It's really hard to know. If you have organized a rally, if you have organized a, uh, a, a, a flash mob dancing in your town square, whether you're lobbying or not. So it's not a really good version of how to measure the, the lobbying. Um, also, how many of you have a volunteer board? Raise your hands. How many of your volunteer board have ever tried to influence public policy? Raise your hands. Okay, if they try to influence legislation, their efforts at influencing legislation count toward your annual lobbying limit. Yes, hard to measure that because you don't always know what they're doing. So that's really hard to know. Have they been lobbying? How do you measure this? It's a bad system. It is a terrible system. The only type of I want to do that has to stick with this system is churches and other houses of worship. How many of you of you in this room are that? Right. That means you have a choice. So, you have a choice of a different way to measure your lobbying. You tell the IRS in a half page form, we are smart, we know how to do it better. You can make the 501H election, you can say, we are going to measure our lobbying by how much money we spend on it. And the way you calculate it is based on what you spend every year on your mission, on everything you do that's related to the real reason your 501c3 exists. So all the money you spend on your productions, on your marketing, on your capital campaign, all the money that you spend is something that is, is used to calculate how much lobbying you're allowed to do. And most organizations can do between 15 to 20%, spend 15 to 20% of their money on influencing legislation. Most of you probably don't need to go that high because you're like, you know what, we've got all kinds of other things we're already doing. And we want to help a little bit with this whole new lobbying thing, but we don't need to dedicate that much. That's fine. But here's the thing. You probably will be doing something to influence public policy, right? You want to be doing that. That's why you're here. But everybody has to measure how much they're lobbying, and everybody has to report it every year, no matter which system you use. You have to tell the IRS and the community how much you're influencing legislation by law on your Form 990. That's the law. It's really hard to measure using that first system. It's a ton easier using the second system, 501H. You continue to be a 501c3 after you've made the 501h election. That does not change. After you spent your three minutes filling out that IRS page and sending it to the IRS, saying we're smart, we're going to measure our lobbying according to how much money we spend on it, you get a clearer definition of lobbying with tons of exceptions. And you also get a way to calculate exactly how much lobbying you're allowed to do every year. And it's going to be almost certainly a ton more than you would use under the, first, the, the earlier system. And any of you who have volunteers who may be lobbying, their time doesn't count towards your annual lobbying limit. So you don't have to worry about tracking it. And it's really easy to track once you figure out how to do it. And we're in there to help you. You want to know? We'll help you out. So you are allowed to influence legislation. And if you do, you always have to tell the government and the public how much you're doing. And it's a lot easier to measure how much you're doing if you use the smarter system, where all you have to do is, hey, here's how much money we spent. It may seem a little complicated, but we'll be there to, help, to walk you through it, should you have questions. And the only types of organizations that may not want to use this second system of 501H are the organizations that spend 
17 million or more per year, and are reaching their lobbying limit of $1 million. <laughs> now, if all y'all are meeting your $1 million limit these days, you don't need this second <laughs> version. But most of you aren't. And so if we, don't, we can't recommend anything in general. We can recommend this is a good system to use. So if you have more <laughs> questions, ask me. You are allowed to lobby, to, lo to lobby and you're allowed to do it. Now, here's an example, $15 million budget. You can spend $900,000 on lobbying should you choose. Let's talk about what lobbying means for real. Under the 501H, under that second system, it's a really narrow definition. You can pretty much tell when you're lobbying and when you aren't, and how and, and to know when to mark it down. We got folks here from um, uh, from LA for the Arts and folks from um, TCG. some TCG. And in both of these cases, they were doing direct lobbying. They were communicating with a legislator expressing a view about specific legislation. We don't need to go deeply into what those mean. Basically, you're talking to a lawmaker and you're saying, this bill is bad or this bill is good. And I want to talk a little bit about what bills mean, but let's also go into the second version. The second version has a different audience and has extra special added ingredients. Actually, you know what, I'll get to that in just a moment. But the big deal is, you are talking to a legislator, you're talking to a lawmaker, and you're saying, this thing needs to be different, and you're going to vote on this thing, so vote the right way. All right, let's talk about ballot measures, because a few of you have been engaged in that. This is from the Urban Center for the Arts, and we collaborated with them on helping them understand their rights um, on to pass to, to go to the voters and say, don't you want to make sure that your dollars go to arts and homelessness uh, efforts. And they did a dang good job, and it was really impressive to see how much progress they made. So here's the scoop. When you're talking to, to when you're working on ballot measures, who's the lawmaker? Voter. The voter? Oh, sorry. The general public. You're not supposed to talk to <laughs> That was for other people. Um, the, the lawmaker, in this case, is the general, the general public. So when you're talking to the lawmaker, the general public, about a ballot measure, you are doing direct lobbying. You are talking to the lawmaker and saying, pass this good law, or don't pass this bad law. Now, let's talk about the second type of lobbying. We've got grassroots lobbying. That is communication with a different audience. It's the general public, it's the voters, it's the regular people out in the world, and you're expressing a view about specific legislation. And by the way, specific legislation is essentially it's a bill with a name or, or whatever. It's also not um, a con confirming a nomination <coughs> of someone. If, it's, if, it's, if lawmakers have to confirm it, think of Betsy DeVos, think of Gorsuch. Those are the, it's a hard word world, so we'll help you be there. Um, but, but it's talking to the general public, expressing a view about specific legislation, and asking the public to get in touch with the lawmaker. <coughs> So, in this case, we've got, we've, uh, there's a, a few ways to do that, there's four ways to do it. One of them is say, contact your lawmaker. Another is to give the contact information. So this has two of those. Call the main legislature, and it gives the contact information. Those are two calls to action. And this one, same ad, no call to action. So I'm going to go back, call to action. This is helping the public contact their legislator. And that's lobbying, because it's communication with the general public, expressing a view about specific legislation, and it's a call to action. Call to action is call your, your legislator or the communication number, but look at this one. It's the same dang thing, except that it doesn't say call, it doesn't have a phone number. This is not lobbying. <laughs> Also, not very effective. <laughs> so, um, that, that's a little reminder. Do your lobbying, guys. Be proud of it. All right. It's not. There we go. Not <coughs> All right. Here are the main points about IRS lobbying. You can and should have the impact. Let's talk about what that is, actually, because we didn't go deeply into it. Uh, uh, we got a little bit of that from, um, from Devin. But, if you are against deportations, who are you working with? You're working primarily with the president and ICE and, and the like. You're against deportations. 
That's not lobbying, because those aren't laws that you're working with. You're working with enforcement. But what if you're working with your city or your county or your state to be a sanctuary or a safe community? You are asking a lawmaker to pass a law. That is lobbying, and that's good. You're allowed to do that. If you're changing a law, you're allowed to work on that. Just measure how much you're doing. You can do that, and just watch out for your, for your lobbying limit. My, most 501c3 organizations can use a better way to track their lobbying. It may seem a little daunting, but actually, once you're there, it's really easy to do, much easier than what you should be doing if you're not already, tracking the lobbying you're already doing. And also, a ton of stuff that you do isn't actually lobbying. It is advocacy. So uh, uh, what the speaker, plenary speaker this morning, was saying all kinds of things about policy. He did not once mention a law that needs to or, does, or should not be passed. He was not lobbying. He was doing advocacy, and that's awesome. But he wasn't lobbying. Contact us for help. Now, all of you are also working in a world where partisanship does exist. So when the speaker was talking about Trump, he was talking about Trump's policies. He was talking about what Trump does. He wasn't saying, let's make sure he doesn't get reelected. He wasn't saying, look, we were able to get good people elected in California. He wasn't influencing the outcome of a candidate election. He wasn't trying to help someone get elected or keep from getting elected. So don't support or oppose candidates for public office. You can absolutely criticize policies. Contact us if you're not sure where your, your message falls along the line. All right, you can continue to fight for your policies during an election season. You have to make it to make sure it's about the policy and you're not criticizing the, 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 the candidate in order to make sure they don't win. And you can do what the, uh, this actually, this came from American for the Arts Action Fund, but it could have come from American for the Arts. Your organization can sign on to a letter saying we need more funding. Your organization can continue to ask for more funding from your local authorities. That is completely legal. It often will be lobbying, and you often will need to note that. We'll help you figure that out. And you are allowed to educate voters. This is a candidate forum for Arts for LA. They, did, together, with, I believe, with the, the uh, Legal Women Voters, mm -hmm. uh, put together a candidate forum say, uh, so that people, what voters, could know who they were voting for. They could also, and, and, and so there's some rules around that. You have to make sure it's neutral, make sure that our, the, the moderator isn't the brother-in-law of one of the candidates, right? And if one of them is a union leader, don't hold the dang thing in a union hall, okay? But you can help your voters understand how, what the, what the, who the candidates are. You also can register people to vote. It is completely legal for you to do that. There, just make sure that you're not doing it in order to get someone to win or to lose. You're doing it to make sure your, your, your community's voices are heard. It can help you figure out what the very clear guidelines are about whether or not you're allowed to work on voter registration. The most important question to be asking yourself is why are we doing this and why now? Why are we wanting to people have people register? Are we doing this in order to get the local city council uh, candidate to win? No? Good. You're probably okay. Let's check and make sure. Rules that I'm talking about here apply to social media. These are my social media pages. I'm just bearing all here. Um, the top one is my professional one. That's my Twitter account. And the bottom one is my personal one. Scroll down, you'll see a ton of political uh, speech there. I'm not showing that here because that's not appropriate. But the idea of um, you can in your personal life, be active. You still have a voice as a human being, and you don't leave your, your constitutional rights at the door. You continue to be a, a, a person who has freedom of speech, completely legal. The only thing is that somebody. Uh, so the only thing is that you uh, you need to make sure it's really clear when you're when, when you're speaking for your organization and when you're not. So make sure you never use your organization's assets or resources to support or oppose a candidate for public office or a party. Make sure that when you're in a forum that you are making it really clear you speak for you. 
So I, when people know me and I walk into a room, they, they know that I'm associated with Alliance for Justice. I say, hi, um, my name is Sarah Mill, and I'm here on my own behalf. I'm not representing a 501c3 organization, or I'm not representing my, my <coughs> day job. I just say it when I can't. There are times you can't say it. How can you, you know, you, you're going to walk up into the grocery store and tell everyone you eat <laughs> that you are not, uh, you're not there on behalf of your organization? No. But make sure people have the best chance of knowing which hat you're wearing when, you're, when you are um, do, doing political speech. Civic engagement, big points. So you can continue to advocate for your, your issues. In fact, you can grow your advocacy for your issues. Despite these partisan times, you are completely allowed to do it. Just make sure that you're not doing it to help somebody lose or win elections. Also, you are allowed to, edu to educate voters and register voters and get out the vote. You just need to mm -hmm. make sure that you're doing it in a population, at timing, and uh, with, uh, with the message that is not to help any single candidate or any group of candidates. And you're allowed to have your own views, you're allowed to be a human being with rights, and you're allowed to be completely politically active. Just don't wear your 501c3 hat when you're doing it and, and show other people that you're not wearing your 501c3 <coughs> hat. We have a ton of resource for, resources for you online. Call us if you're having trouble finding what you need, and we would be happy to help you. We've got them in English and Spanish and a few other languages as well. Anyone who needs help in Spanish, I'm your gal, okay, so we so be anyway. Um, we have a ton of resources. We'd be happy to help you find those. For more information, please contact us. We are here to lighten your load. We are here to make you bolder advocates and to help you eliminate any concern or fear. We don't want to eliminate your anger because that is useful anger. <laughs> Keep being risk takers, not just in the artistic field, but in the way that you are, are changing your community. Thank you. Clearly, it's, not a fully defined. And it's a really good question. Yeah, but we should talk about other points of view on that so we can all figure out together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, one of the questions that I will get back to the hand back in a moment, um, but I want to pivot a little bit. Um, one of the questions we heard early on uh, this morning was around board engagement and that boards can be champions of this work, they can be barriers to this work, they could just be scared or uninformed about this work. John, can you talk a little bit about your engagement with the YPCA board, how that's gone, what you've learned? Sure, when I, we started, uh, uh, when I became, I was the proponent of the ballot measure, Prop S, which was to restore hotel tax allocations to the arts and we partnered with the uh, Homeless Family Services and Advocacy Community. And so I had a co-proponent who was from that community as well. Um, when we started, the board had not adopted this as a policy. The board had in its bylaws, because we're a city-owned building, we're a state-owned building becoming a city-owned building, a bylaw that said we could not lobby. So I was a citizen, a private citizen. Um, but we, at one point, couldn't do that anymore. We had to sign on as an organization because we had to raise money as part of our coalition, right? We had to carry our weight. Um, and so uh, Deborah Cullinan, the CEO, and I got together and built um, a CE task force, which was a board, uh, sort of task force being like, has a completed project, which was by the board retreat, was to adopt uh, a policy of civic engagement. Uh, the first step we had to do was get the board to unanimously take that lobbying uh, thing out of the, um, uh, the bylaws. So we got that taken care of, which was political and took time. But the second thing is we had to really educate them. I had, um, uh, we had a, not Sarah couldn't come, but her colleague in LA came because they all were freaking out. They didn't know the difference between, they had 
no clue. It's the amazing treat of working with board members that they're really brilliant in business and then they come and work for you and they're not. Um, it's like, okay, uh, that, that, that is totally captured. <laughs> wow, I forget now, everything is there. And Jeff Chang, so Jeff Chang is on our board. Jeff Chang's on our board, and so he knows, he knows. Um, so we had to go through that. And then we had to like, I provided sort of the, the kind of central fall guide. I was fine to take the fall on all of this, right? So that they had protection. But they are also smart enough to know that we, that it's in our mission, if we're gonna do that, we had to do it. So we signed on, and then over the course of four months, this task force created, uh, a, like we became educated. Everyone became educated within this committee of a board, and, and they then presented at the board retreat the proposal with the recommendations that was written by Partly you, thank you, Rachel. Uh, and the board unanimously adopted our role as an advocacy organization with Art at its center. And so it is now in our policy to do that. And we have now a standing committee of civic engagement and we have rules in which we would take a certain thing to them, which would be a citywide initiative or, a, or any kind of initiative that really puts your organization out in public. Not necessarily signing on to everything or arts advocacy, that's, a, you know, that's straight up but stuff beyond arts where we really are putting ourselves in the civic realm. So it can be done. There is the culture you have to shift, and then there's just, the, and that is an education point. Once you educate people, you relieve them of the fear. The other fear is you possibly lose people who might give money to you, but that's the fear you take at any turn when you make a change. So you have to just trust that you're gonna get people who are gonna give you more money. You just have to know that, right? And every shift revolves around that. There are people who said to us, I don't want to get emails from you, you guys are an art organization. Why is your art political? And our answer is all art is political, yeah. right? Even if you're at the MoMA, when you see Matisse, that's political yeah. because you're not taking a stand or you're taking a stand to keep the paradigm in place. So once you do that, you make more enemies and you also <laughs> clear the room. And then you get people who are saying, oh, I agree with you. So you have to think about the trade-offs constantly. That's what you do when you engage in politics, right? Which is really kind of exciting. So that was my... Yeah. Who has an advocacy policy with their board? Any documentation out there? John, is y'all's in public? I could, I could send it to y'all. Mm -hmm. I'll figure out the way to do that. No, there's a way to post it on the session. That is 2.0, yeah. you can yeah. post yeah. documents. Yeah. I, 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 and I, I urge that's you. That's great. And, yeah. We'll get that to you guys so you can yeah, look yeah. at that, what the recommendations are yeah. and what we do. Awesome. And that does remind me that I did post the slideshow that I gave you up on the, the, the site for this uh, session, and I posted two fact sheets. One saying 501c3 organizations are allowed to lobby, and another that's an election checklist to make sure you're doing well and, and you're staying safe. And they have an actual ping, uh, thing on their site that's specifically for board members. Yes. Yeah, which is very helpful. Awesome. Another question I heard was around partners. Um, and Jennifer, I want to uh, see if you can talk a little bit about how you develop those partnerships with, uh, with the folks that you're doing civic engagement with, um, either from your experience at Arts for LA or from Board Theater. Sure, absolutely. So, we partner with um, the United Way in Los Angeles to get out the vote. So one of our main initiatives as part of our Art to Vote campaign is to get out the vote and make sure that voters are registered. So just to give you quick demographics and statistics in LA County, LA County has 10 million people. Of those 10 million people, 6 million people are eligible to be registered to vote. Out of that 6 million, 4.8 million are actually registered to vote. And when it comes to election day, less than 25% of those people come out to vote. So one of our big campaigns is the Get Out the Vote campaign, which is where there's two goals. The first goal is to make sure that that 75% of people are informed and engaged and know what's happening in their community and that they make sure to get out on election day, make their voice heard and known in their community. And the second part is to make sure that that rest of that 2.2 million people in LA County are registered to vote and if you're over 18 and are a citizen of the United States that you're able to have the power to vote and make a difference in your community. So we've, we've uh, partnered with the League of Women Voters and United Way and Youth Speaks and different partners to make sure that especially our high school youth know that they are empowered to make a difference in their community and vote as well. Awesome. And John, how do you guys, do you find partners, do, do partners find you when you're uh, working with YPCA and bringing on partners for a particular project when it comes to civic engagement? What is that, what does that relationship look like? Oh, that's basically everything we do is essentially in the civic engagement realm is talking with partners in, in neighborhoods that have received very or little, uh, very to little to no support uh, to, and so we teach them civic engagement practices and we only can do that 
in partnership, sometimes with government agencies, in fact, almost always with government agencies, because there are departments within your city, which are kind of what we call the kick-ass bureaucrats, who really get shit done, and you find them, right? And they may not have really much play in the city writ large, but they get stuff done with you. And then non-arts organizations. There are so many partners out there, Janet did a whole session about this yesterday, correct? Yeah. Um, who are doing this work, and so you have to think of it as a collective impact move. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you can do it. It's not just you should, you can't not. Yes. Right? And I think anybody, Ben's running a campaign in Seattle, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. there's no way you can do this with just your arts people. You can't, you can't get that, you can't get there on your own. The number of people you have to get to sign on to your, to your belief has to include their belief. So you're constantly talking about why, does, why would somebody, in the, why would the unions, why would the hotels, why would all these people care? What does it benefit them? So you're constantly making cases. It's basically a fundraising campaign for a capital campaign, and the capital campaign is about changing policy. That's how I made it sense yeah, of it. Okay. Yeah. And the one thing I wanted to add about partnerships is that a lot of times, especially with organizations and with board members, when you make a partner, it's like, I need that immediate, quick response or a quick deliverable. But with partnerships, especially with civic engagement and community engagement, it's long term. You're in it for the marathon. So don't expect easy, quick things to happen. Invest in those relationships and deepen those partnerships and have that long term relationship because it'll go so far in the future to establish new partnerships and collectives in the future. Topic, the one thing that makes politics different than art and community engagement is that sometimes you have to work really quickly in politics. So mm -hmm. sometimes you have to get them to sign on in 15 minutes, mm -hmm. that you're not developing a long-term relationship. And people who understand politics know that. So it's, it's a combination of things. There's the getting to the ballot move, which sometimes is faster. Then there's the long-term advocacy, which is about building coalition, which really more in this, is in this direction. So they both exist. Yeah. So I'm really interested in how we use the creative process to inform policy how we as artists have some skills, have some resources. Can you talk a little bit about the Market Street prototyping work? Me? Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Megan would be talking about this if she were here. I mean, I think we all, we all are extremely passionate people, and we, anytime we make anything, make theater, we want as many people to gather around this idea as possible. We're intrinsically built to make great cases across the aisle. That's what we do creatively. It's just about taking your creative, your creativity and your art making and, and turning them into assets. They're assets, they are tools for, for greater change. I, and you really have to kind of think, you know what Jeff was talking about? Generosity, mm -hmm. right? And I think nonprofits in this realm have to move outside of fear <laughs> and scarcity into ones of generosity and accumulative power when you actually generously give back to your community and support your community's efforts to make their lives better. This is not, this is actually a, a, an obvious point about engagement, but it's a rarely practiced point, right? We always think that ultimately this is, how is this gonna affect our bottom line? How are we gonna get turn these people into more audiences? How do we sustain this? How do we sustain this? And sometimes those questions come a little too early and they kind of kill the whole generative process, right? So it just ends up nothing and it becomes a really siloed program. Your do good corner of your do good organization, right? Um, so. What we do is we turn our assets into something that is generated out in the community. So you have to, it's a, basically a partly a mindset, right? And you have to think about what you can do to help others and know that that is part of it becomes your narrative. You have now an increased narrative for fundraising. You can now have things that you can write that you've never written before because you can write grants that talk about the amount of work you do for your community in advocacy, right? Even though you can't necessarily write Sometimes uh, you can't get money directly from most foundations in certain, like up, up to a certain point, right? Tell me about that. Uh, so it, that's a really complex topic, but the short version is um, uh, private foundations are not allowed to say, hi, please take this money and go lobby with it. Okay. That is illegal. However, they can say, hi, please take this money and do good things, which can include lobbying. Right. But most private foundations don't know that. If you're working with a private funder and you want us to talk to them, we are there for you. If you want us to talk to your board, we're there for you too. But the and your development team development might not team know this. Might not know this. Right? And they think that that's a terrifying thing, when in fact, putting that into your narrative actually, within this context, highly supports yep. your, your case. So there is huge amounts of stuff that comes back. And also, just people are there for you. It's, I always consider it like if you're about to go under, who in your community would save you? Mm -hmm. Well, it's only those who you've invested in. 
right? Not served, invested in. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a real shift of our paradigm and it makes us so much stronger. So that's how I think about it, right? And everyone does it differently. At YBCA, we're like constantly outside doing this stuff. At other theaters, it's a much more rigorous, sort of in the box, literally in the box move, but you can still do it, yeah. right? It just happens, you all know how to translate this. And I'm gonna add one more thing to this part. I talked I talk to you about private foundations. A lot of foundations are public foundations, and they don't have that same role. They are allowed to say, here, please take this money and go lobby with it. Most of the time, they, do, they, they, they say, here, take this money and do good things with it, or here, here's this part, this, this project you wanna do, part of it's lobbying, part of it's not, here's money for your project. Um, so if you have questions about funders and who can fund what, um, talk to me, talk to us. Uh, most of the time, the, the funders don't even know what's going on, and we can help you educate them. So I know we have some questions we still haven't gotten to from the very beginning, but because this has been uh, so many big topics we've covered just in the past hour, I'm going to check in. Questions about what you've been hearing for the past hour? New topics, yes. I have a couple of age election questions. Yes. Because, um, you know, if you want to like dip your toe into all this, like with uh, voter registration mm -hmm. and you want mm -hmm. to, uh, to be a polling place, mm -hmm. I mean, does, does that fit in the three to five, or do you just go ahead and do the age election? And then the second part of that is, does that scare foundations? Does that, okay. does that send a red <coughs> flag to the IRS? Do right. your boards freak out, you know? Um, I can ask, ask, answer your second question first. The H election actually makes, it, it makes the IRS say, oh, they probably know what's going on. They probably know which end is up. And we heard from the IRS directly that they are not more likely to audit you if you have made the 501 H election. In fact, what we figured out is they're probably less likely to audit you if you have made the H election. And so um, it's also easier to keep your books and present them to the IRS and say, look, here we have clean books and that's way easier to do with 501 H election. Having your spot become a polling place or doing get out the voter voter registration is not, does not involve uh, changing laws. It involves getting people to vote and that, and that is not a, and it's not a type of lobbying. And so it doesn't fall within your either three to five percent under the old bad insubstantial part test, nor does it fall under your 17 to 20 percent of what you can do uh, for lobbying because it's not lobbying. Um, and one thing I didn't mention as far as the, the uh, polling places, um, the biggest thing is, if you have your location, your venue, as a polling place, the biggest rule to be thinking about is making sure there is nothing there that supports or opposes a candidate. If someone walks in that building and they think that your 501c3 is supporting or opposing candidates, and that's for two reasons. One, IRS says you can't support or oppose candidates. Two, polling places cannot have electioneering within 100, with, uh, 100 yards. So, um, the, you, <coughs> There, there's lots of reasons to do it right, but it's relatively easy. If there's a poster in there that looks like it's damning some candidate, take down the poster. If it's a, if it is a, uh, a statue, which has happened, where it's somebody who's, who's it was, cover the statue. Um, it is doable, and we can help you with that. And I think just to, maybe Lori can speak to this, because our, our slightly differing understanding of art making in relationship to this, because we're a gallery space as much as we're a performance <coughs> space. What I understand is that if it's part of the generative act of the art, it doesn't actually. That's, that's that, how that, TCG is. That, no, 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 I'm just telling you what I know. I didn't cringe when you spoke. <laughs> <laughs> that's equal and fair representation, that but is Lori, our, so that what is, is Lori? not our interpretation at TCG either. Artists reflect the times that we're in. That has always been the case. The art itself is, uh, we, we're sort of keeping our advocacy world at arm's length from um, including that as, we're not considering that lobbying or advocacy. It's the art. It will affect what audiences come up, you know, come and attend your, your theater, um, but we're not considering it lobbying. Um, I think I know where the difference is. Okay, but. so the, the basic thing is, there's on the two, to the two sides, we'll talk about lobbying, we'll talk about elections. Under lobbying, if you are creating the art in order to change a law, that is your primary objective, that is what you want to get done, and you want to change a law, and you are presenting to the general public, and then you're, they're just sitting there at the end like, wow, that law would be bad, or wow, that law would be good. Nothing has happened with regard to lobbying. Zero has happened because you have not said, Tell your, your, your lawmaker about the, uh, that this needs to change. You have not said, here's the contact information for your lawmaker. You have not said, here's a postcard, a petition, a website to go on and, and send a letter to your lawmaker. You've also not named the lawmaker. If you name the lawmaker who is the person who's gonna be voting on this and they're your lawmaker in your region, 
that probably is yeah. lobbying. But there's that extra special added ingredient. If you don't give get, say contact, if you don't give the contact information, if you don't give them a mechanism to contact, and you don't name the lawmaker, you have not lobbied. So um, I'm going to bounce the question to you. So, uh, just so art that reflects um, our president and yes. all of the climate, the yeah. policies, and so forth. I mean, it's just critical. Critical can be fine and legal. <laughs> so remember, is it, is it saying, do not let this person be reelected? Is it saying, this person will be a bad candidate? Is it saying, uh, in some cases in the past, this good candidate or bad candidate um, didn't happen because we influenced it. If you are basically trying to influence the outcome of a candidate election, that is illegal. If you are trying to influence public policy, that is probably legal. So does that fit with what you? Yeah. Something and, and that's generally critical of the times we're in and the policies and so forth. Awesome. Yeah. But I just yeah. want to be really clear. Does that help the room? Are we? Yeah. Are we close? Can I, right can I yeah. ask a specific? So like, like yeah. if you're doing a production of the like the resistible rise of Arturo Hui and Arturo Hui looks like Donald Trump. In, then, then, and are you then saying he what, shouldn't get elected? I mean, the, the play implicitly is doing that. But is it talking about the policies? If it's talking about the policies, so, right, and the thing right. is, we don't think that there is a, an arts exception. If the main reason to create it is to create art, great. If the, but if the main reason to create the art is to make sure that somebody doesn't win or lose an election, you're in trouble. The main reason is to create the art, great. Just make sure that, that what is the purpose of it? is a big question. If you have more uh, questions about your stuff, contact us. Right. We, can, we can help That's you really interesting. Mm -hmm. I love that this conversation, because I think if someone were to go after us, right. they could try to make the other case. Yes. Exactly. So we just have to make our case. And that's we, I mean, I think, it's, I think the fact that it's a gray area makes it kind of exciting and dangerous. Yeah. We should go <laughs> and, uh, Seriously, that's, I, that's I think it should, actually, it should have the opposite effect of, of scaring us. Right. It should just like, right? If they paid attention at that yeah, level, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we'd have something. We'd have we'd have a game yeah. to play, right? And then we'd fight for that legislation. Exactly. So I say we we are very clearly in an area where it could get dangerous or maybe not. Let's go. And we talk about a spectrum of risk. We talk about yay. <laughs> we talk about a spectrum of risk. Um, if you are risk averse, you will never say Trump's name on stage. You will never say the name of any of the people that you consider princes of darkness. It will not happen, okay? <laughs> yeah, you are safe. You are in your corner, and you've got your, your crunched into a field position, and you are going to be just fine. <laughs> but what about everybody else? And so, and, and what's your soul going to feel like when you wake up in the morning, okay? So and then there's the other part where you're saying, ah, to hell with it. I'm going to try to say in every single theater performance that Trump should die and should never be reelected, and that, that Trump should should uh, is is, is sh that that we should do everything within our power to make sure he never gets reelected. That way. you're not in a field position anymore. You're standing out there like hit me. Okay, stop my organization. We don't want to exist anymore. Right. And there's lots in the middle. Okay. So talk to us about that. <laughs> yes, uh, sorry, in the very back. The, yeah, really. Yes. Um, if if we okay. present a piece um, that. Maybe does not necessarily encourage this person, but has a very specific opinion on policy or politics. And following that piece, we make available resources for people to contact legislatures, to contact policymakers, but never explicitly say, "Call your representative and advocate, you know, for this climate change bill." Yeah. Even though we just presented a play that has a clear opinion, and yeah. we are making resources available. You're allowed okay. to do that. Is that You're, vague enough to not be considered? No, 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 no. You are allowed to oppose a, a, or, or support a climate. It, that's a policy issue. So if it's all right, this yeah. might be a yeah. good time. Transition. And I'll answer your question specifically later. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, TCG is your national arts advocacy representative in Washington. I'm your person, and while all due respect to Americans for the Arts, which had a lot of play in that, the Performing Arts Alliance is your go-to 501c4 advocacy organization. TCG is one of the founding members of the Performing Arts Alliance, and we do a lot of coalition work with the League of American Orchestras and Opera America and Dance USA and arts presenters and then National Alliance for Musical Theater and Chorus America, there are 14 organizations. Um, and the idea is to advocate on behalf of the performing arts at the federal level and to have the widest possible um, reach among uh, people who care about the performing <coughs> arts. Um, we encourage 
all theaters to actively participate. I think it's been made really clear that you can and should advocate for the arts. My job is to figure out at the federal level what are the issues that impact theaters? Um, and then what is our position on those issues so that we can have a loud collective voice advocating singularly unified, laser sharp <coughs> focus on those issues and advocate for them. Um, so we are advocating for funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. As you know, the president, I believe you all know, the president has proposed total elimination of the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Office of Museum Services, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, et cetera, et cetera, anything that's arts related. <laughs> How do we feel about that? <laughs> Are you okay with that? No. We've got to make a loud noise. That means you can and should send messages to your elected officials to, in fact, we're asking for $155 million for the National Endowment for the Arts in FY18. Now we thought in FY17, you know they didn't, Congress and the President didn't finish that fiscal year's budget um, on time, we had a presidential election and they kicked the can down the, the line and so it was only resolved, the FY17 budget, federal fiscal year is in October 1, September 30 fiscal year, it was resolved in May. The president had proposed a mid-year cut of $15 million which would have adversely affected organizations uh, scheduled to come up in the latter part of the fiscal year. Indeed, instead of coming up with a cut, we ended up with a $2 million increase. This is because we have been doing this work for a long time and we have bipartisan support in Congress. So the President proposes, Congress disposes. We have our work cut out for us. We are certainly taking it very seriously that the President has proposed elimination of the agency, but we know we have a great deal of support in Congress. But we are counting on, TCG has about 500 member theaters. If every theater owned that they should send 10 messages to the Hill in response to every action alert that I send, that would be 5,000 messages every time. That carries weight. They count how many messages come in. If your elected official supports the endowment, you need to write and thank them. If your elected official is never going to support public funding for the arts, they still need to know you're a constituent in their district and you care about that and you have to be on record. They might never agree with you, but they still need to hear from you. Then there's this huge swath of elected officials in the middle that can be swayed one way or the other, particularly freshman elected officials who were just elected to office. You want to influence them to vote the way you want them to on any number of things. And I'll just mention a couple of other issues. Preserving the tax deduction for terrible giving. This affects all nonprofits. So somebody brought up before um, the sort of strategic balance if you're a theater at a university. Uh, the question is more over there. Boy, if you can align with your university advocate and advocate together on preserving the charitable deduction, that would be huge and more powerful than you're doing it alone. So those coalitions, it's very, very important to hold on. I don't know what kinds of grants you're getting from the NEA or from your State Arts Council. Remember, 40% of NEA funds are directed through State Arts Councils. But I bet you, on average, across the field, about 40% of your budget comes from individual donations give or take, right? So we want to preserve the charitable deduction. You can and should be writing to your elected officials to preserve the charitable deduction, and we're calling it the full value and scope, and we now are asking for a big ask on the charitable deduction, universal access to it. The President's tax proposal moves many, many more Americans onto the standard deduction. If you do not itemize your taxes, you're not allowed to take the charitable deduction. So we want universal access to the charitable deduction. There are a host of issues, about half a dozen, that directly affect arts organizations and performing arts organizations. I love Americans for the Arts, but don't get me wrong, we collaborate together on many things, including the Federal Arts Advocacy Day. We come together through this um, uh, loose coalition called the Cultural Advocacy Group to align on all of our issues. But the Performing Arts Alliance looks with a performing arts lens. There are issues that are specific to our sector 
that other uh, organizations aren't going to take on, like preserving and protecting wireless microphones used in the performing arts. That's one of our issues. Um, and protect visas for artists from abroad. So when there was an executive order that said we should have a travel ban, we, the Performing Arts Alliance and the Visa Working Group, crafted a statement. We all signed on to it and we're circulating it in various meetings on the Hill and with other agencies. I'm going to move into the nonpartisanship, bipartisanship comfort. Sometimes board members are in a different place than staff. How many of you are from blue states? How many of you are from red states? How many of you are blueberries in tomato soup? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds yummy, huh? For those of you, it's really complicated. And TCG is a national organization. We're a C3, we're not a C4. And we don't do the, sorry, but we don't do the What's it called? H? Oh, Election. Election. Oh, we need to talk. <laughs> but my salary and my associate's salary combined don't get us to the financial threshold. And I'm doing way more advocacy than all of you. So, and I do direct lobbying and grassroots advocacy. I do both. I need your partnership. But I do want to help you out. This is TCG's, and I'm going to post this later <laughs> or tomorrow on the, the session website. We have a statement. TCG 501c3 nonpartisanship and bipartisanship policy. Why this policy? We clearly have a huge commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Part of the equity, diversity, and inclusion is the range of political views and making everybody feel comfortable. You know what the responsibilities are as a 501c3. There are the legal requirements. There's our commitment to EDNI. Our bipartisan advocacy strategy is that when I'm in Washington and when I'm urging all of you to contact your elect elected officials, it's that you contact everybody on both sides of the aisle. Democrats oftentimes are more supportive of NEA funding. Republicans are often more supportive of the charitable deduction. You never know where your friends are gonna be and whose elected official has a daughter who dances or sings or whatever. Find those commonalities. Our nonpartisanship community strategy is to avoid bias toward a particular political group. We're taking the legality and TCG is taking it a step further. We want to respect the diversity of opinions of our members, staff, volunteers, and everyone we serve. The nonpartisanship community strategy strengthens our ability to advocate across party lines and access diverse community leaders and funding sources. It does not mean that we're silent about issues that impact our mission and organizational values of equity, diversity, and inclusion, but we believe we can be more effective by addressing them without the bias of partisanship. There are perceived tensions sometimes between equity, diversity, and inclusion right now in this climate and our nonpartisanship, bipartisanship strategies. It's not the same thing as neutrality. We recognize that politicians and political parties advocate for and implement policies that cause harm. In order to follow our C3 prohibitions against campaign intervention and strengthen our nonpartisanship community strategy, we oppose the policies, but not the political parties or the specific politicians. That's the line for me. Absolutely advocate for or against policies, laws, appropriations. Don't lump it all together and talk about a person or a party. So I thought I would help with that. We urge everybody to advocate at the local level, and you've heard a lot of local issues come up, state level and federal level. We are as far away here, apparently, on the continental US as we can be from Washington. It doesn't feel far away, does it? This stuff is impacting us all. We need to be involved. So on the TCG website, there is a tab, an advocacy tab. Underneath it, you'll find all the issue briefs, the issues that I've talked about, and more. 
We are sending action alerts from TCG now rather than from the Performing Arts Alliance. We want you to know it's coming from TCG. We want everybody to engage and be involved. If you're not, are you getting action alerts from TCG? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. If you're not getting them and you want to get hooked in, please come find me. I think I'll stop with that now. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. That's great. So as we start doing more and more of this work within our institutions, there's a role for staff to take on bigger roles. How do we think about staffing for civic engagement? And how do we train staff? How do we hire staff? What does that look like? I, I was hired to do that. And so um, you hire at a high level, and you find out who's interested in this in your organization, and you make it a, if it's a priority for the board, it'll be a priority for the staff. If it's not a priority for the board, it will not be a priority for the organization, period. And individuals will get involved, but you have to start at the top, and you have to build from below. You have to do both, right? You have to get them to buy into it, and the authorities are like, this is what we do. Then you have to find all the people in your team who are really engaged in this as citizens, or re relative, re rather residents. And as residents, they are engaged in this. And then you start to build the coalition of people there. And then you go, and then the people in the middle, who are their bosses, will find time for them. Right? And that's the only way you can make the shift. You can't, you can't in good conscience say, we have more work for you to do. But you can, in good conscience, say, our work will not be possible if you don't do this. And we have to figure out our time management from a higher level so that our staff can get more engaged. Right? And it has to sort of, does that make sense? And the best practice we've also heard from folks who moved into the activism space as, as, uh, as performing arts uh, organizations is to have people on your board who are activists and getting those people on the board who have expertise in the field, in the trenches, who also understand performing arts. Yeah. And Jennifer, for those staff who need training, what are some of the kinds of uh, training opportunities that organizations like Arts for LA might offer in people's local communities. Yeah, absolutely. So Arts for LA, one of our main programs that we have is called Activate, which is our arts advocacy leadership training program. And it, uh, we serve, we have two cohorts. One is arts education and one is cultural policy. And it's an application-based program where cultural leaders and community leaders apply to be a part of the program. Uh, it's a nine-month free program and you deepen your leadership skills. So we're already cultivating the leaderships that are happening in the community. So the first part of it is uh, assessing the cultural landscape of LA County, what's happening on the local level, deepening the leadership skills. And the second part of the program is to create an action project in your community. So we've had action projects that are as small as making sure that there is a public comment at the school board meeting to make sure that there is an advocate for a visual and performing arts coordinator in that school district to as big as creating a coalition and collective in the community to talk about gentrification in the arts and what's happening in the, in the, in the actual neighborhoods. So these action projects range, and it's a fantastic program to create advocacy, and also the long-term goal of the program is we want these people to become elected officials. Mm -hmm. We want these people to be advocates because arts and culture, are, are, we want to be at the table of every conversation that's happening with our elected officials we are training these people to become the leaders in their community who will be on the neighborhood councils, who will be in the city council districts to be able to make sure arts and culture are at the center and focal point of funding conversations that are happening. That's cool. The other thing... <laughs> yeah, they, I gotta say, this so is crazy. the model. <laughs> these guys, this, this, this organization is a model. This is, yeah. you have to learn about them. What they are doing, this Activate is fantastic. So it just has to be amplified as many times as possible. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing that we do as part of our arts days, uh, once a year we create an arts day where we invite 300 people to come down to City Hall to show their support of the arts and culture and why it's important in Los Angeles. So we have about 300 people who come wear their red shirts that was in the, the, the photo earlier and show their support in the City Council meeting. We also train arts delegates about 80 of them who meet with city council leaders and their staff to advocate for why the arts are important and to make sure that it's part of the community landscape and it's part of the culture that's happening in the community. So that's our other arts delegate training. And just quickly, just something I feel like we have to, to make clear, and I think it gets clearer as you get more local, though it is not untrue for federal, that you can't just go to them at budget time. No, right. You can't do that. I know you know that, but the amount of time you have to spend being assets to their work, being the place that they call when they need creative thinking, mm -hmm. the more you do that, when you advocate with them or against them, mm -hmm. they, that is where you, it's like, again, think of it as fundraising. That's you right. don't go to somebody just to ask them for money. Yeah. You have it's to figure a relationship. out how, it's exactly. a deep relationship, and you have to continue to do that. You have to think of this all the time. Your win, there are specific date wins, November, June, but the win is long. Right, and it's where you, where we have a place at the policy table as artists and arts are. <coughs> we, that's central. That is where we ultimately want to end up. Mm -hmm. 
right, where they cannot make decisions without colleagues. Yeah. Part of having the relationship is inviting elected officials to your theaters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the rules around uh, giving free tickets mm -hmm. and inviting elected officials? Those vary mm -hmm. widely from state to state what and city to what city. <laughs> so um, in yeah, some cases, we can, we can tell you what the laws are in your state. And in some cases, we have we do not cover all 50 right now. We do have 29. So the likelihood that we'll have your state's high. And at the very least, we can connect you with an attorney in your region who can help you understand what the rules are. So when it comes to building those long-term relationships with policymakers in our local communities, what are do people have questions about that process? How do we do that? How do we communicate with people? If not questions on that, questions on other things. What are, what are questions people still have? Yeah. I'm going to write down some of these questions so that we can gather some answers that weren't answered today and put them on. I have my own question. I just had a comment. Uh, yeah. this is all very validating, uh, but I wanted to emphasize two things that have been brought up in this conversation: tenacity and coalition building. Mm -hmm. uh, on August 1st, in uh, the county of King in Washington State, uh, we will ask the voters to approve a measure. Uh, that will increase cultural access for all the folks who live in King County. If it passes, it will raise $67 million for the full wide cultural sector, arts, heritage, science organizations, etc. It took 11 years to get to the point where we are now. And uh, that kind of tenacity mm -hmm. and the kind of coalition building that we've managed during the course of that more than a decade uh, has brought us to this threshold. Uh, and if we can get this done, uh, it is something that will actually uh, travel across the state of Washington. And maybe it's an example that other folks that can follow in other states around the nation. Awesome. So tenacity, coalition building, critical aspects. Thank you. Thanks, guys. More questions, more insights, one over here? Yes, in the back. Um, so this is hypothetical, but there's been a lot of talk with this administration about lifting restrictions on churches being able to actually advocate and be involved in, in campaigns. Yep. If there was a shift for, for houses of worship, would that somehow filter into arts organizations? It depends which, which proposal. There are a number of them floating out there. One of the, uh, and by the way, uh, Trump's uh, announcement about how things are all gonna be different and his executive order as far as we can tell, that has absolutely no legal effect. Right. Okay, so just know that. The, um, the, the other part of it is, it depends how it's written. One says um, churches and houses of worship um, will be able to continue to do what they're doing and they can just speak when they would normally speak anyway. They just can't do anything extra. And then there's one that's basically saying no restrictions at all, they can, they can jump in full, full, with both feet. From what we understand now, we, we, it's still very murky and cloudy, but as far as we can tell, those are unlikely to actually pass because so many houses of worship don't want that. And so uh, uh, what is possible, though, is something about, about the charitable deduction there, there, that, that is, that's unlikely to, to um, be a, 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 that's unlikely to, to, to pass as well. Um, but the, the point that um, Lawyer was making is well put, that there are changes that could happen that indirectly affect how successful um, 501c3s increase can be in, in getting the, the charitable deduction. So, um, or rather, in, in um, uh, the standard deduction versus. Um, and so, as far as we can tell, Johnson Amendment is not gonna go away anytime soon. Um, and we will try to let you know when, if we think anything changes. And by and large, the nonprofit sector, independent sector, yes. TCG has signed on. I think there are more than 6,000 organizations yes. that have signed a letter opposing the repeal of the Johnson Amendment. Mm -hmm. We actually think that it behooves us to keep an arm's length away from the electoral process. This would not be a right. good thing, and we've opposed it. We're on record. Yeah. Excellent. Other questions? Yes. I was just hoping, John, that you could talk a little bit about um, the process that you went through with your board and perhaps with the staff about how how you select which issues you're going to chase after. We have a sort of bleeding heart problem in my organization where everybody <laughs> wants to be like, let's make a statement about this and this and this. And it's hard to sort of corral that and say, this is really <coughs> what our theater stands for. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons why we uh, engaged what, what we what, why we have a committee now, why we actually have a process, so we can identify the scope 
And it's hard to know. We can't necessarily pre-name them. And it's not just what the issues are, but what we're going to do around the issues that we care about, right? Because every, you can care about every issue, but what is what is what what are you focused on doing? So one of the things we do is we have cabinet, we have we have constant conversations where we respond to staff desire to get engaged, who truly want to get engaged in everything. It's the most engaged staff. It's an <laughs> annoying. <laughs> At times, they're so engaged, right? And it's like, and engagement is over, right? You just want to close the door. So what we do is we just remind them of their power as individuals to continue to work on those things, and we give them resources. So we have a, we have a, which we have to need to update, is sort of our civic engagement resource, where things, where people want to connect on issues, we give them the resources to do that. But it's not something we're gonna take on, because we only have a certain amount of scope and energy to do the kind of work that we're doing. We don't focus solely on arts advocacy. That doesn't, that is not the center of our work. In fact, just to be clear, YBCA was not gonna benefit from any of the money that we raise, we're gonna raise by this hotel tax because we don't get funded by the grants for the arts. But it was our job to do it. It's kind of freed us up in a way because we, we had skin in the game. We didn't necessarily have skin in this game. So it made it really easy to continue to remind people to be their best selves and build a coalition as, as Ben referred to. Um, but in terms of when it becomes a question, like right now we have a, an a artist who's coming in uh, from Cuba, Tanya Bruguera, and her work is extraordinary political, including uh, immigration rights, which are immigrant rights. In fact, she has a thing called Immigrant Movement International. And I have been on the phone with these folks endlessly around this particular issue because we want to have people sign a, a thing called the Francis Effect, where they're sending things to the Pope so that he grants citizenship to in Vatican City to immigrants. Dicey, dicey for us. So we have to gather around that question. Now would you think that uh, an arts organization would be focused on immigrants? Well, if the artist you're interested in is working on that, you better be. This is one of our rules. If, uh, if we hire artists to take a stand, we should take a stand. This is where I get a little bit, you know, what do you call it? Norma Ray-ish around all of that, <laughs> is because if we're gonna invest our work on stage with this politic, we better back it up. We can't do it and then go, not us, not us. That's just the play. That part is not, that's not, that, that's not gonna ultimately where we end up. It's a tricky move because as we've learned, it's great. There's no rule, right? And everyone has a different way of thinking about it. And she's, she's a different kind of strategist than she is. And I'm a different kind of strategist, right? So we all have to kind of think about our most strategic selves in relationship to these moves. Not all the time should you be yelling and screaming at your city hall to get something done. Sometimes they're gonna say, shut up. So you have to listen to potentially hire a lobbyist who knows how, what the actual, so when we, at, I'm on the board of California Arts Advocates, we have a lobbyist who basically said, when you fight for the, when you write that many letters or make that many phone calls, you are not gonna succeed with Jerry Brown. He does not respond to that. He actually has the opposite reaction. So we had very few people contact the opposite of what I would have thought. I, I'm come from Lori School. Like, yell them down, right? Yeah. But there is a lot of that. So it's not just the what, but how. So I think what we do is you have to create a process where the, the shared leadership of the organization makes those strategic decisions, right? Because like you said, you can be fighting for everything. And sometimes the, the best answer is to educate your staff and give them agency and power and time off when to do things. Go, do that. That's a way of empowering the staff to do that, at giving them the space, but not necessarily taking on as an organization. That's the way I can answer that. And what aligns with your mission? So what are those core things that you really, really want to take on? And what other things are you just tracking? There are issues like net neutrality. I'm tracking it, mm. but I'm not front and center on that one. There are a lot of people carrying the water on that. There were people on our staff who wanted to go on the Women's March. TCG did not take that on as a TCG issue on behalf of the field. It certainly aligns, but people took time off with TCG's blessing and marched. So it's, it is, it's about that balance. What's, what's really, re you know, the organization's responsibility and aligns with the mission that you, you can't walk away from it and, and what are the things you're just sort of tracking or letting staff do. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, there are some resources that are listed on here. All these organizations have amazing websites with a ton of resources. In our last three minutes, I want to do two things. First, I want you to take one minute while you're sitting here and write down on your phone, on a piece of paper, whatever, 
one thing you learned, one thing you're gonna go home and do in your organization or in your community. What's one practical next step you're going to take at home in your organization, at home in your community? Either one, one minute, and then we're gonna collect any questions people still have, and we're committed to answering them, and then posting those answers uh, on Conference 2.0. So if you still have questions, do stay in the room, because we're gonna take those questions after this one minute of silence. One minute silence and reflection. <laughs> what they learned, what they're going to do, uh, written that down. So we're going to take questions, uh, shout them out, raise your hand, we're going to document them, and then remember we're going to post the answers to those on Conference 2.0. Or you can just write them down up here. <laughs> but if you have them before you leave, you can take like a little bit to get to the next session. Shout them out. And, and also I am available during lunch. If you have questions, I will be around and I promise to remain in the red sweater so you can use pine meat. Uh -huh. And Lori has a session at lunch I tomorrow. I have a lunch a session on advocacy tomorrow. Today I'm doing a blue star lunch, but tomorrow I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.